the essence of democracy is much more than just that every five years there's an election and that all people above 18 can vote. So democracy is about a system in which the government serves the people mm -hmm. and in which the people have rights but also obligations. Our, one of our biggest failures in the past 25 years have been not to achieve greater equality. We've become one of the most unequal societies in the world. And our constitution is focused inter alia on achieving equality and of course also non-racialism, which is the other issue which worries me very much. But we need to create a more equal society. I think the starting point in addressing inequality is education, coupled with economic policies which will result in economic growth, the creation of job opportunities, uh, and with those two things in its right place, we will be successful in bringing greater equality to all people. Governments of the past 25 years needs to get credit, also the provincial governments, also municipalities, for great strides which have been made with regard to housing, with regard to electricity provision, with regard to better water provision. Some very good things have happened in that regard, improving the quality of life of, of many people. But there are too many areas still not serviced properly. And I think there should be great emphasis on infrastructure development. But in the end, our unemployment figure is unacceptably high. It must be brought down. And that you can only do through coupling education and training, better education and training, with, on the other hand, economic growth which creates jobs. I don't think that's true in the present day South Africa. I think many white people can't get jobs because they're white. I think we've unfortunately fallen into a new form of race classification. And almost in all companies, and definitely in the civil service, black people get preference. There is a new form of discrimination against white because they're white. And in that sense of the word, I think that's a, 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 an incorrect analysis to say white people are blocking black people. I think that uh, that, is, that can be explained historically. Uh, that a greater percentage of white people have university degrees, have postgraduate experience, etc., etc. So it's an issue of, of an historical situation which is being changed day by day in South Africa. It is because of the economic stagnation in South Africa that people can't find jobs. I have a son who is 54 years old, who sold his business and he struggled for almost a year to find a job because there aren't jobs available and because he's a 54-year-old white man. Fear is too strong a word. I have deep concerns, yes. Okay. But I remain an optimist. I really believe that we've been damaged severely in the past nine years under Zumaru. Uh, I think they were nine last year. Or with the corruption which took uh, root so deeply uh, and with us falling into a new form of racism, uh, the opportunity to really build a non-racial, just society to reach greater equality have been wasted. Well, I, I think it's wrong in a country where we are striving for non-racialism. Well, they've laid the charge. I haven't heard from the prosecuting authorities. My hands are clean and my conscience is clear. It's not true. My argument to that is I've never been part of a policy saying kill people. It was later found by court that it was definitely an Inkata assault and that the government was cleared of any complicity in that. Mm -hmm. Definitely been wrongly blamed. I, I appointed the Goldstone Commission. It was my initiative. He, his investigations resulted in finding that in military intelligence a certain activities were taking place against my policy, that the security forces should stay out of politics altogether.
the, you uh, you have to refresh my memory. Yeah, because of yes, I think that has been found that it did happen, mm -hmm. and it was justified, I think, in principle, because he was a the minister of a, a semi-self-governing uh, area of South Africa, was Hulu. Uh, his life was threatened. There were the Truth and Reconciliation Commission failed to investigate 400 more or less cold-blooded assassination of senior people in the Inkata Freedom Party. They never touched it. They never got to the bottom of it. They never investigated those incidences which are proven that they have taken place. So, yes, I have no problem in principle with an office holder of an important office in a constitutional structural system of a country being offered protection when his or her life is threatened. The people were trained, that was what I was told, mm -hmm. the people were trained in order to protect people who were threatened. Yeah. Whether they've been misused or not, I don't know, and I leave that to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to to their findings being tested by history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. It did come to light. I appointed a special commission of specialists from outside government to investigate. I can't remember the names, but it was highly respected people from civil society to investigate the whole secret fund situation. All governments have secret funds throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And to distinguish between those which was in the country's interest and which should be continued and those which should be scrapped. And a mass of that was scrapped. And under my, it was one of the first things I did when I became president, under my presidency, this was taken in full review and changed from where it was, where there was the opportunity to misuse such funds, to strict control and the use of secret funds only for legitimate purposes. I don't know which companies you are referring to. I don't know about that. Let the facts come forward. Yeah, I don't have a problem if the law takes its course. Mm -hmm. I just think we shouldn't be so caught up in the past yeah. that we don't focus as we should in this interview on where do we need to go in South Africa rather than rake up things which happened 30 and 40 years ago as if that will change the future. And why there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It didn't go far enough in certain instances. Mm -hmm. It didn't leave one stone unturned to investigate government and security force involvement. There they did a proper job. It's only when it comes to black-on-black -black violence that they didn't go far enough. I'm not justifying apartheid in any way whatsoever. We were just trying to understand the man behind the face. Mr. Mandela was talking to me about his admiration for Boer generals who fought against the British in the Anglo-Boer War, General De Wet and General De La Rey. So we were talking about other things. We weren't talking at that first meeting about what we would later negotiate about. It's only after his release in April, at the Grote Skier conference, yeah. where we started talking about the real issues. And there we made a very wise decision, which paid off later on. And that is, let us first explore what do we agree about, before we put the emphasis on what do we disagree about. Well. He regarded it as his own problem, but he did mention it. And I regarded, within my ranks, the resistance against what I was doing as my own problem, not for him to solve, but for me and my fellow leaders to solve. In my case, it wasn't serious. My cabinet was with me all the time. Before I made the speech of the 2nd of February 1990, which I made, I gave them the whole speech to read. I made them promise not to even tell their wives what I would announce. But they read it, 
and they stood by me. Immediately after I delivered the speech, I went to all the National Party MPs in my National Party caucus in Parliament and said, sorry, I couldn't take you into my confidence in advance. You've now heard the speech. Are you with me, yes or no? And they unanimously said, yes, we are with you. But yes, within the white electorate, there was a pushback. There was great resistance. There was this far-right party, the Conservative Party, which said, I'm selling out the country, I'm a traitor. And still I think about one third of the white population described me as somebody who sold out. Who, they wanted to cling to apartheid. We abolished apartheid. So yes, it was one of the biggest challenges I faced. And I have later come to understand that it has also been one of Mr. Mandela's biggest challenges. He was always very careful to say, before I can say yes to this, I've heard you, I must go back to my constituents. And sometimes we lost some time because of that. It took, it took extra time for him to get unanimity and support for certain concessions he had to make. So for us as the two leaders of the two main parties in the negotiations, of course there were, I think, 16 parties yeah. negotiating, it was one of our biggest challenges. I was not involved in that, so I can't give you any... You were part of the cabinet. Yes, but the cabinet didn't deal with such, such details. So I was not part of that. That was done behind the scenes, either by the Department of Foreign Affairs or by the military and the police or by a combination of them. Mm -hmm. Was it ever discussed? P.W. Boerta had, had, had a small circle, an inner circle around him. I was never part of that inner circle. And many of the things which happened in the security field happened around the cabinet and not from within the cabinet. The IMF, for instance? I think it's the correct thing for any succeeding government to honor the debts of a previous government. There was benefit for everybody from the, the loans made by previous governments before 1994. Those loans were used to develop the economy, to create jobs. But not for black people though. Of course black people also benefit. It's, it's, but the loans were not asked to benefit black people? No, the loans were asked to achieve certain goals. And for minority? No, not specifically for a minority. There's no evidence whatsoever that loans were used only for whites. Mm -hmm. Universities were being built, infrastructure were being installed, from which everybody benefited. I'm not justifying apartheid in any way whatsoever, but what I'm saying is it's a fallacy to say that loans were given just for the benefit of white people. Loans were given to a country for the country's goals, and the country's goals included developing the economy, developing the infrastructure, uh, ESCOM worked in 1994. There were no blackouts. Everybody who had electricity benefited from it. And now everybody suffers because ESCOM is dysfunctional. I think there's an element of truth in it, not because of race or color, but because of bad appointments made in the nine lost years in Australia of cadres instead of people with the right experience, with the right training into management persons. Mm -hmm. People were appointed because of their connections instead of because of their knowledge yeah. and experience. And I think this has harmed service delivery tremendously. Let us work together. Let us accept the challenges which we face. Let us improve the quality of our education. Let us improve the quality of our training, vocational training. Let us get the economy to grow and build investor confidence. And let us work for greater equality 
and let us rise above racism and take hands as South Africans together. Our future is bound together, irrespective of whether we're black or white or colored or Indian.